I would like to give thanks to the ancestors, known and unknown, those who have paved the way for us to survive this moment of time and to have a reference point to use as a blueprint to deal with these hellish times we are living in. I would also like to give honor and reverence to the woman of the universe for your superior work, for bringing forth the spiritual information through the triple stage of darkness of your womb and giving birth to God. We would like to give reverence to the universe and praises to the indigenous. My name is Raheem Shabazz and this is Necessary Blackness Podcast. Necessary Blackness Podcast, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. with award-winning journalist and filmmaker Raheem Shabazz. This podcast is only for those who are unapologetic because the mind of the conscious man or woman recognizes no monopoly on truth. Truth is relative and always to be sought. Award-winning producer Raheem Shabazz continues the Elementary Genocide documentary series with the School to Prison Pipeline. That film exposes the social engineering done to African-American children in the school system. And his other film, Elementary Genocide 2, The Board of Education versus The Board of Incarceration, takes an even deeper look at the history of the American school system and how it was made to justify subjugating black Americans. These films are on track to be the most discussed films in black America. These films feature people like Dr. Boyce Watkins, Dr. Francis Kretz Welsing, and many, many more. The documentary is available right now at elementarygenocide.com. That's elementarygenocide.com. Hey Atlanta, have you heard? True Laundry Detergent is now offering free shipping in the Atlanta area. Just text the word TRUE to 404-493-0523 or give us a call. That's 404-493-0523. True Detergent is four times concentrated and perfect for those HE washers. Just one ounce removes dirt, brightens fabrics, and leaves each load with a clean, fresh scent. Best of all, True contains no animal products and it's safe for sensitive skin follow us on social media true detergent atl peace and power black family this is your host raheem shabazz of necessary blackness podcast and we are here for another episode and today's episode is called fatherhood a son's first hero and a daughter's first love and i am sitting here with my beautiful co-host queen fumi but before we get into that we're gonna talk about some current news and what's going on around the world as many of y'all know we just finished celebrating juneteenth it definitely was a monumental moment here in Atlanta. I went out and I actually went out both days. The first day I stayed for a little while. Then the second day I stayed much longer. I brought my father out and he always enjoy it when he's out and about and around African people. And while I was out, I ran into several brothers. You know, I ran into a brother, uh, his name is Joel and uh, Powell, and he wrote a very compelling and timely book titled Black Empowerment and Minority Issues. The brother came all the way from Canada to ATL to the Juneteenth anniversary, so make sure y'all support that brother and check out his book, Black Empowerment and Minority Issues, and we are going to have him on the show at a later date. I also ran into my good brother, Tyreek, and many of y'all know Tyreek. He got the RBG sneakers, the Nagas footwear. Make sure y'all go out and support that brother. I also ran into our good brother from the Armin Rod Squad. Armin Rod Squad up, brother Unk. And he is going to appear on the show at a later date. The brother Unk, also known as the 
real black atheist will be making an appearance and he's going to talk about how we can immunize our community from pseudoism and much more. So make sure y'all stay tuned for the time and date on that podcast. Now, many of y'all know that the new movie All Eyes on Me was just recently released. I went out, I watched the movie. Actually, I went out early in the morning. I wanted to be one of the first to view this movie. And it was a good movie. I liked it. I liked the center photography. I liked the storyline. And I know what goes into making movies. And I think these brothers did a wonderful job. I did see some negative comments uh, from Jada Pickett where she didn't like the way that she was depicted. Now, one thing I will tell you about documentary filmmaking is that oftentimes when they do uh, biopics on a person's life that's no longer here, they embellish the truth a little bit to make it a little more compelling. And I don't think they had to do that. And from what she's saying that... She didn't like the way they depicted her. But besides that, I think the movie was, was a great movie. Um, there are several people upset because there were some legal issues. And I think Afeni Shakur was not on board for this movie to be done. And there was lawsuits going around. And, you know, after she was deceased... Miraculously, the movie got green-lighted, got approved, and it came out. And there's still um, speculations that the Tupac Shakur estate is not receiving money for this. I don't know that. I don't think the people that is making these accusations know that. But what I will say is, I hope that's not the case. Now, when I first got into the movie theater... After the excitement uh, went down and you watch all of the trailers for all the other movies that's about to come out, the final presentation comes on. And during the opening credit, the prophetic voice of Daruba Ben Wahad, who is a former Black Panther leader, And as many of y'all know, Daruba has been on this broadcast previously. He also appeared in our documentary, Elementary Genocide 2, the Board of Education versus the Board of Incarceration. And I think his voice set the tone of the movie and the way they put it in during the opening credit just amplified the excitement and what the viewers was in for. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play a brief clip that they use. And this clip is from when Nelson Mandela was released from prison in South Africa. And it was his first visit to the United States since his release. And this took place on 125th Street. And Daruba, who was a political prisoner, for I think 19 years, if I'm not mistaken, actually gave the speech to bring Nelson Mandela to the stage. So let's go to that clip. Let's hear that speech. And then we'll be right back. And we're going to talk about some other things that's going on in the news and around the world. And then we're going to get into our topic of discussion fatherhood a son's first hero and a daughter's first love right here on necessary blackness podcast with my co-host queen fumi i came to give you an address from the political prisoners held captive in the dungeons of the united states they do not want me to give you this address Because they do not want our South African brothers to know that there are black political prisoners here in the United States. Brother, comrade Nelson Mandela, 
on behalf of my brothers in prison, on behalf of the Puerto Rican nationalists, on behalf of the Native American political prisoners, and on behalf of the white American political prisoners, I say to you, brother, we love you and we will not give up the fight. 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 Amen now! Amen now! Peace and power, black family. We are back, and this is your host, Raheem Shabazz, and I am sitting with the lovely queen, Fumi. And this podcast is going to be a little bit different. Now, the topic of discussion is fatherhood, and one that is a father and that knows about fatherhood She is going to ask me several different questions. I'm going to answer the questions, but we're going to keep it conversational and we're going to do a dialogue. So with that, I'm going to introduce the co-host, Queen Fumi, and she's going to ask me some very profound questions. And we're going to get to the bottom of what fatherhood is, why there is the myth of black fatherhood because you know we unapologetically black over here and what we do we do for our people and we're going to just have this conversation all right queen i'm ready what's up raheem hello my beautiful brothers and sisters um thank you for having me on the podcast raheem how are you i am great All right. Now, I have a list of questions. One of the questions I wanted to ask was, how do you feel about women wishing each other happy Father's Day? I'm going to be perfectly honest. I think that women that wish other women and they self happy Father's Day are women that are bitter. And a lot of it may stem from past relationships with their baby fathers. Many of them may have daddy issues. And I think that it's a feminist agenda to not recognize those that are actually doing what they're supposed to do as fathers. So when I see that, I say, "Eh, okay, here go another bitter, angry black woman that, you know, is, is hostile towards black men. Because what you don't do and you should never do is make it inclusive of all black men. And when you make a blanket statement like that, then that's what you actually doing. However, I will say this. There are so many strong black women that are out there and that are raising young men to be the best that they can be. And doing all they can with what they have and what they can deal with. But you cannot replace a father in a child's life. And a father cannot replace a mother. So I think once we know and understand that, you know, when we see little memes and and little things like that, we, we, we bypass that. You know, that's not even... Uh, a motivating factor for a conversation it, it, it does happen you know and we shouldn't give that no energy all right I get what you're saying and my take on that is um you know as a mother I do the best that I can none of us came down here with any instructions you know we're taking everything day by day and just as as mothers are learning fathers are also learning and it's coming from a bunch of systematic emotional issues that I think we have within ourselves and um, I do think we need to start respecting fathers because even if they are not in that child's life I mean they did the best and they sowed that seed so you know that's something to be thankful for right there so my next question because as we know there is a large amount of single mothers in the black community I want to know why is it that men or some men choose to neglect the child and in my case I think it's more trying to punish the mother and not really the child but they want the mother to feel what it's like to be without them you know 
and and why do you guys do that? Like, why is it so many single mothers? How can so many men watch us struggle and take care of these children? Even as neighbors, brothers, like I have three brothers, you know, and, and none of them come get my sons. And it's crazy to me. Like, why don't we look at it as if it's a village like we used to? What happened? Well, one thing that I'm not going to do is I'm not going to speak for every black man and I could just speak for myself. And I will tell you this. I have been a part of my son's life every step of the way. Even recently, I posted on Facebook a picture of me when I was behind enemy lines, when I was in jail. And I captioned it, hugging on my son from a jail cell. And that was taken from a Tupac lyric where he was talking about when his mother was pregnant with him and she was in the belly of the beast. Now, there are men that deal with emotional issues and that may not be present in their child's life retaliation purpose. But, however, that is not the majority of men. Now... There was a recent report that was released by the CDC, and this report actually debunks the rumor that black men are not in the lives of their children. And according to this report, 67% of black men who do not live with their children see them at least once a month compared to 59% of white dads and 32% of Hispanic dads. And that was from the CDC. But that's not the narrative that's being painted in the media. So when we look at the narrative that's being painted in the media, it's totally different from what the reality of it is. So black men are in their child's lives. Whether they live in the household or they or they do not live in the household. Now, there was another thing you said where you said that you have neighbors and they don't even check on you or, you know, knowing that you are a single parent and different things like that. Now, what we have to understand is a lot of us still look at the European mindset of the family nucleus or the family nuclear. And I think we need to get out of that. In African-centered culture, we always had the extended family. And what we need to do is we need to understand that the extended family is just as important as the nucleus family. And the extended family consists of grandparents, uncles, aunts, older siblings and cousins so if there is not a father that's present in the household you have cousins you have brothers and you have other male figures that need to step up to the plate so that we can raise strong black men because whether you want to believe it or not we are at war and there is a war on the black child particularly the male child. There's a war on black family. There's a war on black people, but particularly the black male child. And we're going to get to that a little later on, but I'm going to let you finish and answer the rest of your questions. I think you are completely right as far as the uncles, the brothers, and, you know, the community does need to step up. But we also know that it's a really big problem with a lot of our men, as we learned watching, you know, Elementary Genocide Part 1 and Part 2. And Part 3 is coming soon. But we know that a lot of our men has been pushed into the prison systems. And it's really hard out here for us women because... You know, we really don't have the brothers and the uncles and the fathers ourselves. So what is it that we can do, like, to fix this problem? Well, first, let me thank you for that shameless plug of elementary genocide. Make sure y'all go out and cop that. And you are 100% right. Mass incarceration has completely decimated the black community. In fact, racism, poverty, and mass incarceration has decimated the black community. Now, 
when we talk about systematic racism, we have to go back in history. We have to go back to the Homestead Act of 1863. And this is an act, a legislation that was signed by President Abraham Lincoln. And it gave away millions of acres of land to whites and none to blacks. So we all know that land and home, it provides economical stability and security for families. So they operate in at an advantage and black folks are operating as a disadvantage. Give me a second. Walk with me. Now, if we look at the redlining that was done in Chicago from the 1930s to the 1960s, blacks couldn't get a home loan. The real estate board created laws that stipulated to white landlords that they couldn't rent to blacks. This created poverty. Now, remember, I told you all this stems from racism, poverty, and mass incarceration. And this is what gave birth to welfare, where the woman was penalized and denied benefits if a man was present in the house. So this put the black man out of the house. So that's why when individuals and medias and pundits and talking heads, when they want to talk about, you know, fatherless household, let's go back to history where we can look at the narrative that created this situation. So now the man is not president in the house. So from housing to subsidize, the man was given no choice but to leave the home. Then you had the drugs brought in the community by the CIA that led to mass incarceration. And then if you look at the lending, the hiring practice, when it comes to black folks, we are at a disadvantage, especially the black man, especially the alpha man, the alpha male. So this is what creates that whole narrative of the black man not being in the house. Did I answer your question, sis? Yes, you definitely answered my question. And you also bringing up the point of the situation with the welfare system. I remember it was a time when I applied to get daycare assistance. And um, they made me take my child's father for child support. And they also, you know, like a lot of times when I would go down there and I would try to get Medicaid or something like that, um, I would see families of, I don't want to say foreigners, but, you know, foreigners. And it would be the father, the wife, and the children. And they would be in line and they would receive assistance. But me, I've been working since I was 12 years old under the government, like where they're taking taxes out. And every time I try to apply for assistance, I can't get it. And they definitely do still in 2017. Still, they don't want the black man in the home for women who want to receive benefits. What is it that we can do? I mean, what, what's going on? Why do foreigners get to come to this country and receive Medicaid, food stamps, and everything else? And people like me who've been here since day one, I can't even get help. That is a very profound question. And in order to understand that, what we have to do is we have to realize that it all goes back to inequality when it comes to economics for black folks. Now, you mentioned that a lot of immigrants, and you also said that there was African immigrants. And what you have to understand is that there's a different standard when you're an immigrant coming from Africa and you're an African American that was born in America. They will rather give them a chance at the American dream than you. And that's just the narrative of white folks and the psyche of white folks. So we have to understand that. And the solution for that, because you was like, what can we do? The solution for that is there are sisters that are out there that you can establish a relationship with and do a cooperative where you might trade your service for their service, where 
they babysit your kids and you might offer some type of service that you do and now with the advent of social media and the internet you can create your own job so i think that what we have to do is we have to be self-sustaining individuals that's able to provide jobs for ourselves and our people so we don't have to rely on the government now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't seek help from the government sometimes you you know you have to seek the help but that should be the last option they're taking the money out of my check Raheem this is what I'm saying I, and, and I want my 40 acres and a mule and I, I feel like I should be able to get assistance from the government whenever I need it for however long I need it when you say they're taking money out of your check are you talking about taxes um, that's exactly what I'm talking about I hate Uncle Sam <laughs> Well, you're absolutely right. You know, in taxation without representation, you know what they say about that. And I think that what we have to do is that we have to hold our elected leaders accountable. If they're not providing child care service for a certain demographic of people in this geographical location, then that's on our elected officials who represent us in Congress. And that's why... We have to stop electing individuals based on them being black because it's just black faces in high places. We have to elect those who have our best interests at heart. So with that said, I know you had two or three more questions. Let's get to that. Well, I would like to know as a black mother, a black woman and a sister of yours, what is it that we can do to make the job easier for that so that you guys can be more a part of your children's lives so that it's not so many single mothers out here? I think the first thing that the black woman has to do is understand the systematic plan that is being orchestrated against the black man. And I think that together, we both can counteract that plan when we work in union with one another. We can't fall for the divide and conquer. Right now, a white person with a criminal record has a better chance of getting a job than a black man with a college degree. So if you have a man that's in the household and he's working a job that is barely covering the bills, you have to understand that society is making it that way that he can't get that good paying job. And he's probably doing the best that he can. And I think once that we understand that, it's one thing to understand it, but what is the action? What is the end game? What plan do we have as a family, as a unit, where we could be self-sustaining, self-sufficient? And I think once once we do that, that we will we, be in a, um, a better position. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take the black woman to understand the black man. And that's not to um, take the black man off the hook. You know, a lot of y'all brothers, man, y'all got to step up to the plate. You know, y'all got to take care of these babies. You have to be a present figure in that household and you have to provide financially for them. I know situations where individuals probably don't come around as much as they should and probably just come around during holidays, birthdays and special occasions. And a lot of it has to do with not being able to fulfill their financial obligation. But if you know kids and you know anything about kids, they will just rather you be there. Just your presence alone can make them happy. And you don't always have to, well, I got to take them to great adventures. Oh, I got to take them to the movies and, and different things like that. So let me say this before I close out. If the black woman and man do not take the time to understand each other, then guess what? They will be kept in a state of conflict with each other by racist dynamics that are orchestrated and put in place to keep them behind. Once you understand that, 
then you're going to know how to deal with this situation. The first thing is understanding that. And I think that anybody that listened to this broadcast will be able to understand that. And let me tell you something. I don't have all the solutions to the problem. And there are those out here that may have the solution. We need to have dialogue. We need to come up with the solutions to this problem. Because this is a problem that's affecting a large majority of our people. Um, what I wanted to leave off saying to everyone is that, you know, like he said, a lot of times the men don't have money and they feel like they can't come around because, you know, they don't have the money to give the woman or they haven't actually been there. And I think as women, we need to start understanding that and still allow these men to come around. I have a lot of friends who they don't let their child's father be in their child's life because he's not providing or he's not doing what her new boyfriend is doing you know and he she talks bad about the father and it's not it's not right at all I think we really need to stop down talking to our men and that's online in front of our children and just period we need to start building our men up we need to start you know reminding them that they are strong that they are beautiful that they're needed and I think that like you said we do need to have a lot more dialogue so shout out to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day and happy Father's Day, Raheem. And um, peace and love. Great words, inspirational words for all those fathers that's out there. And definitely know that your words are appreciated. And not just on Father's Day, but every day. We need to hear that. We need to hear that affirmation. I'm not a religious person, but in the Bible, it tells us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. So in this day and time, we are living out that prophecy of the government being on our shoulders. And what they are, you, what they are doing is using the black man by not having him in the household. But we can do whatever we want. You know, the government can't legislate your man not coming around once you have your house in order. And another thing, the first line of defense is not to even deal with them. And that's not going to them for subsidized, not going to them for money, not going to them for child care. If you're in a situation where you don't have to, don't use that as a mechanism to get back at your baby daddy <laughs> or your husband. You know, you, you just can't do that because once you allow them in your business, it's it. It ain't like, you know, all right, I don't want y'all involved. You done already opened up the floodgates, man. And, and let me tell you something, man. You don't want these white folks in your business. So... That is the conclusion of this episode of Necessary Blackness Podcast. We are going to be back next week, same time, same place. Make sure you download us on iTunes. Make sure you download us on Google Play. And we're going to have our new addition to the Necessary Blackness Podcast family. It's going to be all three of us here holding it down on this podcast. We ain't going nowhere. Now, you know we made it to number 10 on that iTunes. You already know me. I'm a beast. I'm not going to be satisfied till we get that number one spot. And I think that I assembled myself around the right individuals that can help me reach that plateau because you know I can't do it by myself and I got two beautiful queens that's going to represent and we're going to do this so peace and love black family and before we leave I want y'all to take this message with y'all this is a joint that my brother Kalanji Changa sent me and I listened to it and I was like yeah that's the theme music and that's the music that's going to take us out for this episode of Necessary Podcast Peace and love, black family. Yo, what's going on, world? The one and only Uncle Shecky, Apple Jack. Um, the only thing I want to really read 
to the people that the, the youth that come after me is just don't forget the people who came before you, paved the way for you to enjoy the liberties and freedoms and, and the, the opportunity to express your gift um, that came before you. Very important to honor that. The only way you'll really be able to move forward. You know what I mean? You don't have to relive the past, but you definitely got to remember who came before you. Before you. That's it. One love. Peace, peace. This is illustrated. If I could leave you with anything, I, I would leave you with this. No matter what, what goes on in life, no matter what happens, good or bad, always remember the Most High and that you walk with the Most High and that the Most High is on your side. If I could leave you with anything, I'd leave you with that. And, and just and enduring the, your goals in life and your accomplishments and, and your failures, just, just know the Most High is always with you and on your side. And enjoy the process of accomplishing those goals and enjoy the process of the failures because you learn something when in, in everything. So at the end of the day, you know, I have a good perspective of life where everything is good because when you fail, it's a stepping stone, when you accomplish, it's a sense of achievement, which will always you know, make you proud and make your family proud. But always know that you walk with the most high, whatever you do. You know, you're not going to be here forever, so make it memorable. Peace.